Hey fellas, what if I told you the largest supply chain hack in history had occurred? <laughs> well, in the context of something known as NPM. Now you might be like, well, Moody, I heard about crazy hacks all the time. What is so new about this one? Well, I want to just start by showing you something that you may not know exists. This is NPM, which for anybody that doesn't know what NPM is, NPM is the largest software repository in the world, okay? For the JavaScript fellas, this is where you go to to get access to a whole bunch of packages that saves you time and, and whatnot. Now, what if a lot of those packages, some of the most popular ones, consisted of malware that was out there to drain your money and steal your personal information? So this is actually consisting of two hacks. Now, the first sign of this hack that actually happened, the first vector, was an account known as Kix. Now, Kix is an account that actually runs and maintains some of the most popular packages in the entire game. So some of these packages like debug, like color, like leaf, these are packages that billions of downloads occur to on a weekly basis, okay? These are very popular downloads. Now, what effectively happened over here? Well, let's get down to it. Now, how did Kix get hacked, all right? Did he run, did they run some crazy malware? Did they, you know, click on a spooky ad? No, actually, it's how most hacks tend to happen. They uh, clicked on a phishing email. Now, thankfully, due to this graph provided by Veroni, they could show you exactly what was happening, right? The attacker sends a phishing email from a phishing support email link over here, which contains a link that once it takes you to a fake login page, obviously the, you know, victim in this case, Kix, would then provide stolen credentials and two-factor authentication tokens. See, much like YouTube hacks, whenever somebody clicks on a shady sponsor, they usually grab your Google or YouTube authentication tokens and go to town on your channel enough to the point where they instantly convert it to a scam live stream and YouTube promptly removes that YouTube channel and of course a big headache has ensued with the YouTuber who has to get that channel back but in this case the attacker now adds malicious code to the NPM packages and because nobody is the wiser everyone mass downloads these packages. So because Kix had his account hacked, Kix was a maintainer of popular software. And so the hacker in this case was able to inject serious malicious code into very popular NPM packages, making it the largest, from my understanding, supply chain hack in history, or at least in NPM scope, which is actually pretty large, okay? Tons of JavaScript guys, tons of people use NPM. This really is an important resource for people that are developing Developing and whatnot. So at this point in time, if one person gets hacked, you have to ask the question, could somebody else in this chain also be downloading and possibly clicking on phishing links? I mean, it's possible. Generally, when you get hit with phishing stuff like this, it's always imperative. You start changing your passwords. You start re-issuing uh, tokens. You start basically invalidating all of the hacked credentials as quickly as you can. So basically, if you received an email from support at npmjs.help and you followed whatever instructions were provided by the scam phishing email, you were pretty much impacted. For a lot of people who wanted to know if they were actually infected, they could run these quick commands to see if somewhere in your dependencies tree, malware existed. So for the kicks hack, what was actually the malware that was running? So in this case, the malware that was actually running in this situation was a crypto stealer malware. And of course, one sample that was provided was actually right over here. So this is deobfuscated from Security Alliance, and you can read it for yourself. Now, generally, you can see that obviously it's looking for, again, Ethereum, it's looking for Tron, it's looking for LTC. This is a crypto stealing malware. And of course, the job for this is to always sniff for crypto credentials. So when you reverse engineer the actual malware, when you start to deobfuscate it, you can see that for at least Ethereum requests, it overwrites the destination address of any call to approve, permit, transfer, and transfer from, so any of these calls, to an address known as OXFC4A4858. Now again, you can also take this Ethereum address and kind of get a rough idea and see through Etherscan just how much money was possibly sent over, right, through these compromised crypto wallets. 
Now you can see from 10 days ago, uh, the actual NPM exploiter from all these various accounts ended up amounting, at least in this wallet's Ethereum value, to $454. And of course, that's not really a whole heck of a lot <laughs> when you figure that this is one of the largest exploits in history. So what was really funny about this hack and what was really hilarious is that despite the actual magnitude, the attacker may have actually stolen a very minuscule amount of cash. Somewhere around, from my understanding, uh, five to 600 US dollars. So realistically, what's funny about it too is like, if somebody was using this to financially like enrich themselves, they made nothing. But surprisingly, if you add in the cost of all of these cybersecurity experts that were basically tasked on with, you know, cleaning this hack or dealing with the aftermath, probably cost far more down the road and impacted probably millions of dollars of actual contracts at some point because of this hack. Now, obviously, this hack was pretty huge in one way, but there was an even bigger hack that had happened. See, there were actually two breaches. Now, what we're going to talk about is a self-replicating worm, and this is something known as the Shai Hulud hack, which happened a few days afterwards. So basically, a self-replicating supply chain worm now infected about 100 to over 200 different NPM packages. And in fact, as I'm recording this video, there are more and more that appear to actually be coming up. So I'd be like, how did this happen, Muda? Where, where would this have happened? How did this occur? So for instance, right over here, this is just one of the actual like packages that, are, you know, I believe was infected. And you can see that weekly downloads for this kind of stuff is huge, 2.2 million. So when you factor in how many people are downloading possible infected malware, it's a lot. And again, the target for this are people that are developers. So how did this actually happen? So the self-replicating worm, what it does is it steals the developer or cloud credentials, which are basically the developer GitHubs, their Azure tokens, AWS, and then using malicious actions on GitHub, it then starts reinfecting various other packages. Hence why it's dubbed a worm, right? It just keeps worming its way through the entire system. So as it hits one package, it then tries to see if it can infect two more packages or four more packages or however many more the worm goes. Now, when people were investigating the first guy that was hacked in this, apparently it was the account Tech Support RXNT, which is where the first implementation or the first showcase of this Shy Halud worm actually showed up. So according to the guys at Checkmarks, how Shy Halud works is infected repositories include a JavaScript payload that performs many actions, including downloading an open source secret scanner to start identifying those various developer credentials, the most important thing that they're going after. Then it starts by doing this by probing the various AWS or those cloud environments. So again, it determines if those defenses are in place and then starts staging next portions of its attack. So anytime the worm finds valid credentials, they get sent back and are then used to help propagate more and more infection. Now the history of worm software is interesting. If you wanna know how a worm works, you can look at the first computer virus in history, which is Creeper, which again, the concept of Creeper was it was a software that would go through ARPANET, for instance, and again, it would simply just replicate it. It would be the first self-replicating computer worm. And it wasn't really malicious software. It would basically just output, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. So again, very minimal impact. It was just a test. And because creeper was the first worm, obviously we developed Reaper, which was technically the first antivirus software because its job was to delete Creeper as it moved across ARPANET, which is the original or precursor to the internet. Now, you might be like, well, Muda, does this affect me personally? Uh, no, not really. At the end of the day, what they're doing is they're actually targeting the developers in this case. So rather than targeting, you know, your crypto wallets or just the end user, their idea here is to get as much 
uh, you know, information on these developers as they can. They're trying to possibly steal secrets and then possibly find other compromises or, again, vulnerabilities down the road. The idea is not so much targeting me and you, it's actually just targeting the developers because secrets in that world are just worth a lot more from my understanding. What about now? What is happening, ladies and gentlemen? What are we gonna be doing going forward? Well, as it's still ripping itself through, it's certainly not as large as the kicks attack that happened before, but I think the funniest thing about the kicks attack is just the headache that was coming from it. And the fact that the actual hacker behind it literally earned almost nothing through the process. Now, of course, if you're the end user, depending on what Shai Halud is used to grab, like what kind of information the people behind it are grabbing, uh, this could actually have a trickle-down effect if the secrets behind some of these software vulnerabilities or anything discovered could be used against you down the road. But again, for the first attack, the crypto one, obviously nothing really massive happened. You're talking about, you know, a, a theft of uh, pennies to maybe $500, okay? Very small take, <laughs> very small amounts of cash to be earned from arguably a pretty massive supply chain attack. But Shai Halud is a very interesting hack in this situation. It's really one of the most interesting sort of worms that has sort of come out. It's hitting multiple different packages inside arguably one of the largest repositories. And again, the, the people that are researching this kind of a hack to figure out, you know, where this worm is coming from, who's really behind it, and again, what the intentions of it, it's just an ever-escalating story. And again, Shai Halud is something that isn't entirely made on its own. Obviously, it uses software that you can even get access to and play around with. Software like this, for instance, Truffle Hog, which is one of the pieces, one of the components, which again was used to find, quote unquote, the leaked credentials. You might be like, how does this just sit inside GitHub for anybody to play with? And the thing is, ultimately, when it comes to cybersecurity, right, people can literally engage with this kind of software in a good faith or, again, Stuff like this is kind of like playing with a Swiss Army knife, okay? There's a lot of bad things you can do with a knife. There's also a lot of good things you can do with a knife. It really depends on the n intention of the person behind the actual keyboard. But ultimately, look, at the end, I don't think Shai Halud is led by anybody that wants to do anything good. Shai Halud, you know, other than being a cute nod, from my understanding, to like Dune, really is just a piece of software where, again, I want to know who's behind it. Because ultimately, they're there to target the developers, and they're there to find, you know, some level of vulnerability. And ultimately, I think down the road, whatever they find, either they sell it to another group to use against the end user, or just against, you know, people who are developing software. But the moral of the story here is, obviously, uh, you might not know what NPM is, but the people that design the internet that you work on or the various tools that you use absolutely know what NPM is. And for those people, it is absolutely pant-shitting moments. Because anytime you download a package, you do have to do your due diligence to make sure whatever you're running isn't infected. And you, Always have to remember that anytime you get a phishing email, anytime you get an email, always verify where the fucking domain is from. Because ultimately, all these hacks kind of started, it seemed, from people, you know, well-meaning people, educated people, ultimately falling for a phishing link. Which goes to show you that no matter how smart you think you are, it's always possible for you to get scammed. And when you get scammed, sometimes the repercussions can be extreme. But yeah, one of the largest supply chain attacks happened in history, actually. And uh, is it bad? Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, I'm sure the people behind it, the teams behind this, are doing their absolute best to clean shit up. And in some cases, at least when it came to the first crypto attack... <laughs> how do you have such a massive attack and you can't even make a... You can't even make a thousand bones, bro. <laughs> That's just funny, dude. Anyways, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.